Welcome, students, faculty, staff, community members, and friends. Thank you for joining us tonight here. Diversity, first generation, working class, low socioeconomic status. All of these words are topics that have been topics of conversation here at Women this semester. We have handed out flyers to alumni, created our installations, and rallied the whole women community as we um, tried to come up with solutions here on our campus. Not only have, this, have these topics been prevalent here, they have been prevalent topics nationwide. With a recently published um, New York Times article, top colleges that enroll rich middle class and poor, colleges and universities across the country are scrambling to come up with solutions to get more diverse student population into their institutions. But more importantly, they're scrambling to come up with solutions to have to retain those students. While well, being admitted to college is difficult enough, staying there and completing a degree is an uphill battle for first generation students. Vicki Madden, a longtime educator, wrote a piece for the New York Times, Why Poor Students Struggle, which showcases this challenge that many never really understand. As she writes in her article, teachers like me can help prepare students academically for college work. College counselors can help with their choices, financial aid, applications, and the bureaucratic details. But how can we help our students prepare for the tug of war with their souls? This struggle is one of the key issues as to why first generation working class students leave college and never graduate. Vicki Madden is a first generation working class student. She graduated from Barnard College with a bachelor's in English and has a master's from Columbia University Teachers College. She has worked as a teacher and as a technology integration coordinator, as an instructional guide for student for school leaders, and is now an instructional achievement coach for the New York City Department of Education. She has been teaching teaching uh, she has been teaching in New York since 1985. She has helped countless students navigate to the Don Dean college application process. Today, Whitman, thanks to the Student Resource Center, the Intercultural Center, and the um, President's Office, has the honor of hosting um, Vicki as she talks about the struggles and joys of being a first generation working class student and how to better help those students. Please join me in giving her a huge Whitman welcome. Washington, but I've never, this is my first time in Walla Walla, um, so it's just really nice, and um, I want to thank Whitman for bringing me out here to talk about one of my favorite subjects ever, social class and educational access, um, and, and which are very live on the national scene now, but I, I'm happy to have a chance to talk about them kind of in the western place where I first uh, experienced them. and. Um, so when I was young, growing up in South Seattle, south of Seattle, before Microsoft, it was quite a different, very small city. Um, I really had no idea that I was from the West, right? Because I was in the West, and I had no idea about any, uh, anything else, um, kind of no perspective on it. And when I got to New York, um, to go to Barnard College, which was on the Columbia University campus, I heard so much about the Western tradition, and I was really excited by this. You know, I thought, wow, they're so welcoming of me, and you know, my sort of being a descendant of cowboy folk from Montana. Um, and then I started to notice that, like all this talk about the Western tradition, I was very confused by it. And of course, I was sort of used to being confused because I didn't really have the educational background that a lot of the kids I was in school with had. Um, so. I was waiting to kind of make sense of what these references to the Western tradition meant, because they seemed to have nothing to do with what New Yorkers called out west, right? Um, so one of the reasons that I wanted to go uh, to Barnard, and particularly to be on the Columbia campus, which at that time Columbia College was all men, was that I wanted um, I, a high school teacher who was very important in, in my um, you know, going away to college had really advocated for the idea of a core curriculum, which I understand you guys have a, a core freshman encounters curriculum that sounds very similar to what I was um, allowed to take when I was at Columbia, um, which is sort of a literature humanities um, kind of great books here. And there was, you know, like 60 or 70 titles on the syllabus for the first year. And 
I had heard Plato, Dostoevsky, and Jane Austen. You know, I hadn't heard of any of the other ones. It was actually sort of a, one of the funny comments on the New York Times, uh, on my column online. Um, a woman who insisted in her comment that it was simply impossible that I had never heard of Homer. That I might have not have read Homer, but it was absolutely not possible that I hadn't heard of it. I, I found this very interesting. Um, I don't think she had a goat in her yard either. <laughs> but while I was taking this uh, lit, lit hum course, we read all these great philosophers and historians, and I was just marveling at how American political thought was so similar to Greek political thought. And I, and I kind of thought that this was because American political thought was right. You know, I mean, we believed in rights and democracy and people voting, and that was the right way to think. And, you know, I was an American, and I believed that we had the right attitude about things. And one day, I just suddenly thought, oh, these Greek thinkers that I'm reading, maybe the founders of, of the United States read them too. Maybe the reason it's so similar is because there's a line. And I, this was the first time I had ever had any kind of thought like that. <laughs> that, that I was in a particular time and place, and there was a reason why the ideas around me were prevalent, and I and I sort of recognized that kind of um, perspective expansion. It's very sudden. Um, that it would have been similar if I'd been studying Chinese political thought. I probably would have seen the differences and then understood that in the U.S. we had a particular set, right, that had to do with time and place and our particular history. But that was the very first time I'd had an experience like that, of that sort of sudden pers uh, perspective expansion. And later, you know, in, in the years in college, I had. Uh, similar things, you know, reading Mayan love poetry in a very different language than English, um, the structure of the language, um, calculating the sort of chemical makeup of the universe to calculate time in, in geology. All of those experiences really sort of completely kind of blew my mind in terms of understanding uh, particular time and place and how perspective is attached to, you know, where you're standing and what you know and what you can see. And um, I didn't yet know that kind of what was happening in those moments was an epiphany, right? Because um, I didn't know that word. Uh, but, and things have changed quite a bit, I think, because a few years ago I was riding bikes with my then eight-year-old son, and he said to me, Mom, Aristophanes had an epiphany in the bathtub. And I was like, wow, you've heard of Aristophanes? You know what the word epiphany means? And he said, well, sure, it's a sudden realization of great truth. And I said, wow, when I, was, I learned that in college when I was reading James Joyce, and you're eight years old. And he goes, well, I saw it on The Simpsons. So, <laughs> you know, it's a really different world, though. Um, so I, I think that, you know, when I started to think about um, kind of this topic and as an outgrowth of my op-ed, I was really thinking about what is the point of college and what is it for. Um, and for me, I think that it, it's was a very profound experience of ex uh, perspective expansion, just in multiple dimensions and in multiple subjects, personally and intellectually. And I think that um, that, to me, is what the heart of especially a liberal arts education is about. And you know, so there needs to be um, a sufficient change between a student's old world and the new world that they experience in college, right? And so I, I mean, I. I came toward this topic um, when I tried to kind of retrace my steps and see what led me to, to put my writing into the op-ed piece, because I'm kind of an essayist and a memoirist, um, and I, so I don't always write op-eds. Um, but I was thinking about you know, my own experience, because my, my oldest son graduated from a liberal arts college. I was running into my former students, as I wrote about in my article, and hearing that some of them weren't staying in college. Um, and then I was reading this national uh, you know, kind of dialogue about this, the challenges of diversifying college, of elite colleges economically. And one day, my 22-year-old son said, kind of in the context of job seeking, you know, I don't know if college really prepared me or gave me anything that I did in terms of what I have to offer a job. And I instantly said that is because it didn't change you enough. I, I didn't give any thought to it. And when I, when I thought about why I'd said that, I realized that I was really thinking about 
a boy, you know, one of my former students who was a Posse scholar at Colby, who um, had, I heard recently, had left Colby. And the college counselor that I worked with at the, at the high school in Brooklyn said to me, I was really surprised to hear that Danny struggled academically. And I thought to myself, well, I've been following Danny on Facebook, and I knew that he was very, very involved still in making music, um, recording music and releasing it and making music videos with another boy from his church who I'd also taught, and that he was very, very talented. And, um, but I was thinking whenever I saw his Facebook posts, wow, he's got a lot of energy engaged in his artistic life. Does that leave him enough energy to make the transition to a demanding liberal arts college? Um, and I thought about how I was so willing, you know, to kind of leave my goat in the yard and my, uh, you know, moderately criminal siblings and, um, you know, go to New York and, and, and go to museums and, I, you know, it was my goal to marry a rich man and have a summer house in Maine with, you know, everybody who was in the social register. Now you might think that I'm shallow, and I might have been. <laughs> it did not turn out, my life did not turn out that way, but at 18, you know, we're, we're exploring. Um, and, but that I was completely willing to give up my old life for this new life um, in a way that Danny wasn't, right? And I also recognize that um, my son, had, you know, had just had a very different life, so the, the level of change was different. So, I mean, when I was growing up, like, um, I'm just gonna read you a tiny, tiny, tiny little segment of my memoir that um, is about when I was young, first, just entering school. So, in our neighborhood outside the city limits of Seattle, no one went to preschool, and public kindergarten cost money. Like all the kids I knew, I spent my days outside with little supervision, playing in the woods and swamps. Everything about first grade at Bull Lake Elementary School came as a shock. Until the first day of first grade, I had never before needed to stand in line or open a milk carton. On that first day, when I was six, the little girl sitting next to me turned and beamed what I thought was a goody-goody smile. I bet you can't make me scream, she said. I bit her, and she screamed. <laughs> so the teacher thundered, we can't have dogs in the classroom, and ushered me out into the hallway. I came from a household where violence was practiced freely, and I was genuinely confused about why I was out in the hall. In my mind, I had triumphed. But here I was, alone, ashamed, and excluded. Like a mini anthropologist, I began to study the ways of other people to try to fit in, or at least to stay out of trouble. So you can imagine that I had to change quite a bit along the way, and certainly once I got to college. Whereas my son, you know, was born in New York City, went to like public schools full of the children of lawyers and, and you know mayors and famous writers and actors and um, by the time he went to college he'd already mixed with so many of the sort of intellectual kind of interactions that, that I had not. He'd written papers, the ten page papers and presented them to panels of adults and and so there was a way that leaving New York City to go to a small town the difference, I think, was not profound enough for him to feel like he'd changed that much. Um, fortunately, he did spend a year abroad in Cameroon, so that's, that was a big change. Um, but when I compared his experience to Danny's, I thought about the um, need to transfer energy. To, and that Danny was not willing, apparently, to just sort of put his old life on the shelf and say there's nothing of value there. Um, I'm going to just adopt this new life um, in the way that I was, that I was so willing to jettison the old world. So, you know, when I think about how college changed me and how college should change students, I, I really think about that, um, a pretty profound change. And then um, the question of how a more diverse student body should change colleges kind of comes next. But considering it just the, the individual journey, I want to put forward the idea of the hero's journey, Joseph Campbell's monomyth, um, about that he discovered reading uh, stories through cultures all over the world and through time um, as, a, as a structure to understand our collective experience. So I'm not going to drag us through every phase, 
But I think that there's some things that really uh, bear on at least my experience as a first generation college student. Um, the idea of like starting out in the ordinary world in my old world and having some call to adventure, the, the sense that um, I, I could go out in the world to do something different to, um, than what my people were doing then. Um, and I think that that call to adventure is often followed by the refusal of the call. Um, and it's kind of like we all like change until we actually are asked to change, and then there's a lot of resistance to it frequently. Um, and among students, it's you know not necessarily that's too hard, but it's you know that's too strange. I don't want to go that far away. I don't want to leave my family. Those people are alien to me. Um, and so often it's a meeting with the mentor that makes the difference in going out into the new world. Um, in my case, it was a particular teacher that made that difference. I think in my students' case, it's often the college counselor combined with teachers. And, and then there's the road of trials. And I think that that's the really most important part, right? The road of trials where we run into obstacles, we have to find allies. And uh, so we run into obstacles and possibly enemies, right? Um, and then at the bottom, the ordeal, in, uh, so in, in some of these models, it's called In the Belly of the Whale, from the Jonah story. Um, in, in sort of uh, stories like Welsh mythology-based things, um, it'll be uh, in the dungeon. Um, in the Star Wars story, it's when Luke is in the trash compactor. And in hindsight, I had a, an ordeal experience myself when I was in college. Um, and when I, when I went back to start my junior year of college, I couldn't start. I got back there, um, I, I went to my classes for the first few days, and I just did not have the energy to do it, to muster. I, I, don't, I suppose you could call it depression. Um, at the time, I didn't really have the internal vocabulary to say what was happening. I just knew that I could not muster what it took to, to uh, go to my classes and do the work. I also was quite aware that I had eight semesters only of financial aid, <laughs> and I, I, I was aware of that, and it was a very real thing, because I was on almost a complete full ride. Um, so by the end of the first week, I went to the dean's office, said, I don't know what's going on with me, but I can't stay here this semester, and I borrowed $100 from the emergency fund and took Greyhound back to Seattle, um, where I worked as a waitress for a year. And um, you know, that summer, the summer before that, Year, I, it was the summer of 1980, and I'd been living in Portland, Oregon with some kids who went to read, um, working for the Fish and Wildlife Service during the day and working at the Sizzler Steakhouse at night. Uh, the life of the working class person, you know, I worked all the time. And um, I don't know why exactly that happened to me. I still don't, all these years later. But I believe it has something to do with identity conflict, and I think that that's very relevant to this topic. Um, at the time, uh, that summer, my father and my brother had come down from Alaska, where they'd lived for many years. I'd spent some time in, in Montana, at Miles City, at the Bucking Horse Sale, which is like the Mardi Gras of Montana. It's a big rodeo. And all my cousins were there, and it was where my parents were from. And I had the experience there of understanding how alien I was from most of my relatives and from the life they came from. And I think that that kind of in the trash compactor experience had to do with the clash of my new identity and my old identity. And not yet having made peace with the fact that I was going to have to take my own life and go forward and, and in some way make peace with that over time. Um, so I spent a year in Seattle working as a waitress. My dad went into a rehab for alcoholism, came back out, started drinking. Um, you know, there, there were family troubles and all that. And at the end of that year, I understood that my life was not in Seattle, right? It, the, the life that I had with my family, that I absolutely wanted the academic life. And I, um, I took my sword and I, I went back to New York, you know, and that that was the right life for me. And I think that that um, kind of identity conflict is not unusual um, for first generation students um, because because you're making a change, right? And it's really important um, for there to be space for, even when students don't understand why they're struggling, um, for there to be some space for uh, re leaving and returning and, and people who can talk to them about things like this. Um, so 
I didn't really, um, I did not really understand what it was all about. And I think that's also very important. Um, I think, you know, students, I hate to break it to you, but, you know, when you're 18 to 23, uh, you probably don't understand everything about your future life. Um, as I don't at 54, right? I mean, life is an adventure, and I think that that's part of why um, I think that this is a, a useful idea for the change we're making in college. Um, that we don't have to know everything in advance, um, but that we are called to be, deep, I think, by college, to be deeply transformed intellectually and personally. Um, and I, so I'll get to the fact that I think perhaps some students are not changed enough while others are being asked to be changed a lot. Um, so now I want to transition to the, the sort of idea of um, what's college for in the collective sense and how can a more diverse student body change the nature of college, how should it, if, if, it, if at all. And so I want to start with um, a speech that Janet Yellen gave recently. She's the Fed chairman. And she gave a speech that was characterized in the press as unusual for the Fed chairman because she talked a lot about how uh, she was not sure that the increasing weight income gap, income gap uh, was, could be aligned with the values of the founding fathers, the, you know, the founders of this country. Um, and not just the top 1%, but the incredibly increasing stratification between the top 0.1% and 0.01%. Um, but she talked about a couple of mechanisms for social class change, economic change, one of which was preschool, and the other is college, right? So, you know, she said that the median annual earnings of full-time workers with a VA are still 79% higher than the median for those with a high school diploma. So that despite the escalating cost, college is still worth it, right? And I, I just want to say first that I would never actually put the primary value of college as being economic. And that might sound disingenuous coming from me, who grew up on food stamps, and now I am solidly uh, in the top quartile, and my kids go to sleep away camp and spend a year abroad and go to private liberal arts college with financial aid. Um, but, you know, that's really, really important, but it's the intellectual transformation to me that is the real value of college, and I actually think that they're so intertwined that they can't be separated. When we uh, say that college graduates are paid more, I, re I believe that when that's for a good reason, it's because we actually have the skills of critical thinking and creative problem solving, which go back to that kind of perspective expansion that I was talking about in the beginning. That because with a good liberal arts education, we're able to see connections in disparate topics, we're able to understand point of view, and so, I personally think that is why we are more valuable when we are well educated. Um, that it's not in and of itself an economic issue. I'm sure there are many people who disagree with me, but I think that the intellectual value of college to me just cannot, uh, it, it was everything to me. Um, so, the, I think the question in terms of, of the still being a good value, right, is at what cost economically? Um, this is one of the slides that Janet Yellen shared, and you know when I talked in my article about um, how still it's the socioeconomic, uh, the income distribution in selective colleges now is still just about the same as it was when I went to college, which is that 70% of the students come from the top income quartile, and only 14% come from the bottom 50% income quartiles, or in, bottom 50% of income earners. So this is looking at the ratio of education debt to salary. And so for the bottom 50%, in the change since 1995 to 2013, not even 20 years, and, and a time period when wages have pretty much remained stagnant, actually, um, at least for everybody but the top 1%. The, the, inc the student loan debt has gone from Let's say you're earning $100,000, just for easy math. It's gone from having about $28,000 in student loan debt to having almost $60,000 in student loan debt for the bottom 50%. And that's pretty extraordinary. The top 5%, it's actually gone down a little bit, and they don't carry that much debt in ratio to their income. And the next 45% has doubled, but it's still nowhere near 
the debt load that the bottom 50% is carrying. And you know, if you if you read in this area, you know that the kids in the bottom 50% may not even be getting degrees, so they're carrying a lot of student debt without degrees. Um, so I think that this slide to me just raises the question of like at what economic cost are we attempting to diversify colleges? Um, and I'm that is I'm simply going to raise that question, right? Um, but because then I want to ask another question, which is at what cost culturally, right? It's a, there's another thing going on, which is the, the culture. So there was a recent article in the New York Times called The Paradox of Integration. And it was talking about how, um, it was actually looking at South Africa, that when colleges were first integrated, the very first students of color were, were quite happy to be there. And that as more and more students of color were introduced, were and admitted, they got less happy. And so this is the paradox of integration that's being investigated. And one of the professors stated this line on the top, people are fine with racial differences as long as there's no cultural conflict. And I think we can substitute the word class there too. People are fine with class differences as long as there's no cultural conflict. As long as the new people come in and fit themselves to the system as it is, there's no cultural conflict, right? So this social psychologist Quote, you know, talked to all these black students and said that they felt that the university was really good at posing at being integrated while overwhelming them with its enduring whiteness. I just think is a great line. Um, and this reminded me of when I, in the 90s, I was working in a progressive private school in Manhattan. And in the 90s, we called diversity multiculturalism. This was in the a, a newer phase of trying to change things. And um, so I was at a faculty meeting and the teachers were sharing about how you know, that they got, they brought their families together at potlucks and everyone brought food from their culture and it was just a lovely Benetton-like evening. And I, I raised my hand and said, well, what if people bring food made from Spam or Miracle Whip or Velveeta? And everyone in the room went like, ooh, ooh, ooh. I'm speaking as a person who grew up eating, you know, eating that. And I, and I said, you know, I'm not trying to just be difficult. Um, I think that what if some of the people actually have different cultural values, right? What if people believe in spanking or hunting? Uh, things, I know lots of people who believe in, um, but, but certainly not in, in this Manhattan progressive private school. Very few people were. And, you know, when I pose those questions, um, I, I would say no one said, had much to say in return because they were questions that hadn't really been considered. Um, and I, coming from where I came from, I felt that they're real and that if you really want to have cultural diversity, uh, you have to recognize the fact that cultural differences are not trivial um, and, and really think about the real differences. That it's not just that we all each bring our different and spicy food, you know. Um, so in the case of the South African University, there were portraits around, all around the dining hall of the founding um, founding dignified white men. And then there were also portraits of naked black men, side by side. And when the students, the new students of color raised objections to that, the alumni said, you're attacking our culture, right? And so for me, that raises the question of what is it that, um, what are the aspects of college or university that are essential to the intellectual development of students, right? That really are designed to change people's perspective and have them grow in all the ways they need to grow? And what are the elements that are simply residue of the past, uh, sort of cultural residue of the founders that are kind of unexamined? And, and how do we find space to have those conversations in thoughtful ways? Um, because I think that there are absolutely things a college or university needs to stand firm on, and I'm, I'm just going to say that students who are often advocating for change, which is your job, um, but the university needs to be really clear on what should not change because it's about what an, what an education is about, um, but also be open to a deep consideration of what's just residue, what's just residue of the past. Um, and that, I think, is a lot of tension. And there's a lot of tension that's happening in a lot of places. Um, and and I, I would say that I think, you know, so many majors that have come into play since 
since I graduated, um, feminism, race-based, uh, uh, gender studies, all those things have uh, the effect of expanding our ability to expand our perspectives, right? So they, they keep doing that work of having people question the, the perspective that they're standing in and see if they can look at things from a different point of view and a wider point of view. But sometimes uh, the, the ways in which students want things to change is, needs to be stood up for by the college and say, no, this is about intellectual growth. And I think that you know, when I wrote in my op-ed piece comparing myself to Richard Rodriguez about um, the, you know, the old world and the new world and, and uh, not leaving the, having to leave the old world behind and recognizing uh, a certain estrangement from, from our old families, um, I think some people responded to my piece that, that I was uh, complaining about having to change, and that is not it at all. But what I do think is that as a first-gen student coming from a working-class Western, I had to change a lot. And I'm not convinced that every student is changing enough on college campuses, um, that every, every student is being changed as much as they need to be. Um, so. I think if we're asking people to change profoundly, if we're asking some people to change profoundly, then how do we change university and college culture so that there's a much more, um, so that everybody is working to embrace and appreciate difference more? That it's not the new people who are coming that need to fit themselves to the, the existing system, that everybody is working to embrace a wider range of difference. Um, so, Change does require tremendous energy, and I'm interested in spreading that energy, uh, that, that energy expenditure across more people. And a, a former student from Brooklyn was told by a college professor in Maine that I'm going to take the Brooklyn out of you. And I'm pretty sure the professor is not referring to artisanal makers of beer and cheese in the hipster parts of Brooklyn. You know, I'm pretty sure it was the black working class sort of kind of housing project. Um, and I, you know. That professor said it, but how many people are thinking it that when we're we're trying to kind of rescue poor children from difficult circumstances, that we're going to change, take take their old world out of them and put put everything about our new world into them? And, and I think that we just really need to open up that that process and think about it more deeply um, about the value that everybody's bringing. So, in in a way, to me. Um, you know, this comes to the sort of cultural diversity. And one of the things I noted in my piece that's similar to this Take the Brooklyn Out of You business was a former student who was told in his small town in Pennsylvania not to wear a hoodie at night because it made him look too sketch. He was told this by multiple people. And, you know, I think that after Trayvon Martin, there's no, you cannot use the word hoodie without understanding the sort of deep and dangerous cultural misunderstandings that can happen. Um, and that it's, for some people, it's a life endangering proposition, uh, the lack of understanding about the value of different cultures. So um, how do we raise the stakes for everybody to be more interested in, in embracing change uh, without also creating a, a culture of let's call out everyone. Uh, the term calling out is not one of my favorite expressions. Um, that anytime anyone says anything that could be offensive to anyone, they need to be publicly shamed about it, you know. Um, I think that it's hard for us to change culturally, and there needs to be space uh, for difficult conversations that, where people can um, say things even if they're not sure that it's perfect um, without being attacked. So, in a way, um, I mean, I think that comes to the question that's a long-standing question in America, which is, what you know, is the purpose of college to be a gatekeeper to decide who gets to have the privileges of higher socioeconomic and educational experiences, or is it the portal to the American dream, where anyone who works hard enough can make that climb? And you know, I would say that it's always been an uneasy combination of both, um, the gatekeeper and the portal, and that that. Uh, uneasy combination creates tension that creates energy, and, and I think that that's always pushed growth, um, that the tension between those two things. I want to talk about a new kind of tension um, and a change that has to do with the apps like Airbnb or Uber, where um, so
So technology is allowing ordinary people who have unused resources to find a market for them and be able to you know, use their empty room to find somebody who wants to use it. Um, they have their car and their time. They can use Uber to give people rides and make money. And um, you know, this is kind of below the purview of the gatekeepers, right? The people who do the taxing and the regulation. And there's definitely tension if you read, if you're following articles about this in the press. There's tension in a lot of municipalities about those things. Um, so one of the articles had a term um, "dead capital," which is a this term coined by a Peruvian economist, and it's it's a terrible term in a way, "dead capital." Um, but meaning it's currently unused capital, right? It's they're potentially productive assets that people have, that ordinary people have, but they don't have a market to make, to be able to use them. Um, and I, when I read this, I thought, well, this is referring to sort of time and rooms and cars. Um, but I thought back to the, the, the researcher that I referenced in my piece, Anthony Carnevale, and he wrote another report called uh, America's Greatest Untapped Resource, talking about working class, high achieving students. And I think that there, you know, to try to expand uh, the, the great number of working class students who are not currently in colleges, especially not in elite colleges, is a form of unused kind of energy that could really enrich our, our culture and our economy. And so um, recently, the Bloomberg, uh, Mike Bloomberg's uh, philanthropic arm uh, and the Aspen Institute, um, Khan Academy, there's a, there's a collective working right now on reaching working class kids who, they've defined it as high achieving kids who are in the lower socioeconomic um, quartiles, 50% I think. So currently about 25% of those kids do not go to college at all. Only a third of them go to colleges with at least a 70% graduation rate, right? Where they have a fair chance of actually graduating. And 40% of them are in colleges with a low graduation rate where they probably just end up with all that debt. So there's, a, I think, an enormous untapped resource that collectively could be, um, could change our, the kind of nature of our economy. Um, especially because with more low-income students, the nature of the conversation and of, of the socioeconomic culture on a campus would be different, right? We would not be so much in the minority. Um, and I think that, you know, when I, when I got to Barnard, I had no interest actually in identifying myself as a working class Westerner, as a poor Westerner. I um, just wanted to pass, right? And I worked pretty hard on passing, actually. Um, I had a couple of very rich boyfriends with summer houses in Maine, and I got to meet the Rockefellers and all kinds of things like that. Um, something of a waste of energy, really, but it was fun. Um, so at the time, uh, you know, is it because identity politics wasn't as well developed then? Uh, you know, I don't know. We were busy. We protested to divest out of South Africa, and the ERA amendment was kicking around in state capitals before being thoroughly defeated. Um, but I, I saw, when you're alone, um, I would say that as a lone working class, you know, poor person on, on campus with a lot of rich kids, that could not be leveraged as a strength because I, because I was alone. So instead it was a shameful liability. So um, I think that when you have allies and a mentor, then you can leverage your difference to be a strength, to be an enricher of the conversation. But if you're alone and it's shameful, you can't because it's too risky to step out and say how different you are and, and possibly you don't understand what's going on in some ways. So I think that trying to hide one's past and the kind of secrecy um, shuts down a huge amount of potential energy, both in the individual students and also on, on a campus and in our culture. And I think that's why I just think that, that Whitman's first gen working class group is amazing. I think um, just like Posse and Bridge Quest, like what we know about of what it takes to kind of raise awareness and have the question of expanding diversity on campus not simply be the business of the first-gen kids, but have it be uh, everybody's business 
I think is extremely powerful and it takes it out of the, the realm of the, the secret um, and the, the problem. Um, so I think just the, you know, the last, this is my last little slide and last piece. I just want to come back to the question of is everyone on campus changing enough? Is everybody having their perspectives expanded sufficiently? Um, American demographics are changing. And uh, so I think that it's really important to switch from how can we help these new, more diverse people become like us on campus to how can we have a different, more energetic, more diverse and dynamic university where all kinds of talent can flourish. Um, and that means how can everybody understand through perspective expansion, where is the edge of my comfort zone and push it and, and you know have everybody being a little bit less comfortable instead of just one group of people. Being less comfortable. So, um, I think that's really the 21st century realm. That's all from me. Thanks. So we have time for questions, and I'm really hoping you have some more comments or challenges. Hi. Hi. Yes. You. Uh, um, you uh, shifted a fair amount between um, referring to race and class. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's a lot of overlap mm -hmm. between those. But I'm curious, um, given your experience as uh, a white working class student at a college that was both elite economically and like dominated by white people. Uh, do you think that uh, in, in general the white working class like shares more in common with the like racial elite or the economic or like um, or, or the, the rest of the working class uh, in these sorts of situations? Like are they more able to assimilate um, or are they more shut out of like much of the rest of the people trying to break into um, elite colleges? Well, I mean, I would say that one thing white people ha have as an option is more assimilation, right? I mean, and I, I say that because I spent so much time, you know, hanging around with people in the social register and trying to pass. Um, I ended up, you know, working with um, a school that was about you know, 90% black and Latino students, so in Brooklyn. And, you know, I, I think that in America, we don't, we are not comfortable enough talking about race. And so it's hard for us to see what we have in common. Um, I, I think that politically, there's always been a divide and conquer from the very beginning in the revolutionary times to make sure that poor whites and indentured white servants did not ally themselves with slaves. And, and I think that's, that's still the case today. Um, and it's internalized. Um, you know, I mean, my brother always tells me, the only person who doesn't get a break today is the white man. I'm like, really? Because when I look around, I don't see it that way. <laughs> but, you know, I, but I think that when you're working class in a difficult economy, you can certainly feel like you are beleaguered. Um, and so, I, I, I don't know if that really answers your question. I think it's just a difficult, question that we're still very, very uncomfortable talking about race, and so that makes it harder to talk about where race and class intersect and where they don't. And I'm always very careful with my students. Like, I know that a lot of the reason I worked with the kids I worked with was because I identified with them, but I was also careful to not make assumptions about experiences that I hadn't had. I don't know if that answers What would, uh, so thinking back about your experience at Bonner, what, what would make, uh, what things do you think could be different there that might lead us closer to this model of, of not expecting to be unlike the other students at Bonner, but perhaps, were there, were there experiences there where people were able to break down some of those barriers for you, or, or, or how do you see it, the university changing, the college changing to, to meet this um, well, I think it's, all, it's some of the kind of assumptions about how we read and how we work and 
um, what everyone knows, what kind of background knowledge everybody has. I think it's good to question those, you know. Um, I felt like that it was just my problem that I didn't have all this background knowledge and I set about um, kind of trying to fix that. Um, I think that, you know, I would say that there's less, um, you know, 35 years later, there's less uh, unity about what ki kids in any high school will all have. And so in a certain way, that lends itself more to sort of as academics having to think about what's the common amount of knowledge we, we want our students to have and how can we make sure they have it. Um, and without necessarily being able to assume they have it when they arrive. So I, I think that's a big part of it. that it has to do really with the academic experience. Um, and I mean, for example, you know, when my son was in college, he was not allowed to turn in his first paper without uh, a receipt from the writing center on it. And what I liked about that was that his, his teacher didn't get papers from all the students and then say, you're a bad writer, you need to go to the writing center, right? Which sets up a very different dynamic. They said, they had decided as a college, Every single student, when they hand in their first paper in their first English class, must go to the writing center and have, have that receipt stapled on it. So that every student knew where it was, had had to go to it, didn't have all these misconceptions about what going to the writing center meant, that means I'm a loser, that, you know. Um, and I just think that that kind of thinking about what sets up a level playing field is part of the work that, that the people already on campus have to do. Now, I'm sure I said some things that you guys disagree with. Hi. What I measure often um, in New York Times, so it really resonates with me, is the idea um, of creating an atmosphere in which we value um, our students for what they need to be success. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if you have strategies that you have found that work with students that you've worked with or in your own experience. Um, Can you say a little more about what you're thinking about? Um, I'm just, I'm just curious about how, sort of, as a whole, we can work together um, to figure out how to um, sort of really respect and honor everybody's identity, right? There's like often um, admissions pro processes, and all these different processes really, um, you know, value academics, so extracurriculars that are um, based on what high school you went to, right? And what you mm -hmm. are doing, and so. Well, sometimes I like to think about um, kind of essential questions that pertain to sort of literature or whatever we're studying, but also start with just a real life question that everyone can access. You know, so um, I mean, I, I think about just a, a teacher I worked with, you know, this was in high school, but in college, just that started with the question of, you know, do we have free will or are we fated to uh, repeat our family's patterns? And this was a prelude to studying Oedipus Rex and then fences and some other works, you know, works that would go along with that theme. But a question like that, every single person can have a take on that before they've read any of the books, right? Um, and it's meaningful to human life. So it's not, um, and I, and I, or I, I was actually talking to Noah about this the other day. I was thinking about, I, I work with a lot of high school uh, teachers in terms of in designing curriculum, and I was listening to an episode of Radio Lab uh, called Patient Zero, which was about trying to locate Patient Zero in, um, in the typhoid outbreak. I won't say her name. Um, and then, uh, so it's typhoid in, in New York in the early part of the, 19th, the 20th century. And then it's um, HIV, and then they just updated it to Ebola. And I just thought about how, um, as a spine, as a skeleton for studying biology, that's an amazing kind of real life thing to start with. And I, I think that often 
we have a conventional sense of how academic subjects should be structured, and we assume that everybody agrees with that because that's how it's always been. Um, and I think it's more accessible if we try to think about why does this matter, actually, you know, um, because because that's how everyone can attach meaning to it and understand why they should do things that might look ridiculously arcane and unnecessary, the way I might have felt about footnotes back in the day where you actually had to count up from the bottom of the page and leave a certain amount of space. Um, you know, that there's conventions in the academic world that if you're not like just really buying into it 100%, you want it to ride on meaning, on the coattails of meaning, you know, why the, the conventions are about being in, in an intellectual conversation and, and acknowledging other people's opinion. And, um, so I think a big part of it for me is thinking about meaning um, and why we do things in academia um, that, that kind of provide more meaningful introduction for people who may not come from valuing that. She had completely average GPA and uh, SAT scores, but Yale and the University of Chicago kept sending her all these really great things, and she said she wanted to find out why. So she realized, she looked into it and found that you know Yale is rated very highly in the US News and World Report ratings because they reject 92% of their applicants, right? So, I mean, I think that there are kind of um, cynical aspects the business of, of it. Um, I'm so, you know, as I said before, like, I am so, like, still, all these years later, like, gobsmacked by the intellectual life I discovered, you know, and, uh, I mean, like, brings tears to my eyes to just think about it. I feel like, and, and actually, that's what I would say, that I think that that's an opportunity open to kids who come from families who have not been academic, to kind of find this incredible excitement of like the world of ideas and um, writing and, and that life. Like I think that's an amazing source of energy for the individuals. And at the same time, that potential excitement is an amazing source of energy for colleges and universities. And I would just suggest that not all people who come from families who've always gone to college are all that excited about you know, taking a lit hum class or Pl uh, Plato and, and Her Herodotus, you know? Um, so is every working class student all that excited by that? You know, I can't say that, but I was. And I think that, that um, my experience with my students in New York was that they are so like open to like real intellectual excitement. Um, and kind of what I was saying before, if you, if you can communicate the meaning and the value of it, they really want in. Um, they really want into the conversation um, when it's communicated in a way that lets them in. So. I'm an idealist and a cynic at the same time. <laughs> Really 
not necessarily have the Congress of the board of the comfort zone push to that they should some conscious effort to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering about the kind of strategies that colleges can use to really force people, mm -hmm. um, you know, even if they aren't necessarily making active effort themselves to have their well, it's interesting that you ask that because I was actually thinking about the adults in the college and university pushing the edges of their comfort zone, um, but obviously students too. Um, I mean, I think, I guess I would just kind of go back to what I was saying about how difficult it is in America to like really think about kind of race and class in a real way. To me, that right there is comfort zone pushing. <laughs> And I think that, um, I mean, in a way, in what I was saying earlier, that for a college or a university to really find a way to have a really um, kind of ongoing and rigorous discussion about what parts of the experience we're setting up for students to have here are about their intellectual expansion, and which parts are just like, this is the way we've always done it, and this is what we believe academia is. And I think that that, to me, is the area of comfort zone pushing that, that I think is necessary. Because so I think until the adults do it, you know, it, it, they can't really figure out how students necessarily need, need to do it. Didn't I, like, make anyone mad or say anything you totally disagreed with? Now, one thing about living in New York so long the Pacific Northwest is so much more polite than New Yorkers are. Like I could sit, you know, I remember being at, a, at an intersection where the car in front of us did not move when the light turned green. I guess the person was like reading their phone or something. And I said to my sister, aren't you going to honk? Like the light is green and they're not moving. She's like, oh, no, we'll just wait. I'm sure they'll, you know. And, and then it happened again. And I was like, oh my god, you have to honk. Like it was just, in New York, like the smallest measurable unit of time is time between the light turns green and the car behind you honks that you should move. <laughs> um, you said there were some things that the uh, colleges need to sort of enforce the retention of, mm -hmm. to create the kinds of intellectual challenges that make, uh, help young people change so mm -hmm. And I, I gather that you want our for that to be precise in this uh, expansion of the comfort zone, this kind of enlarging of perspectives and mm -hmm. development perspectives. Um, that also typically involves sort of um, some basic skills on the parts of students. It's, it's really hard to kind of jump into the highest level of the conversation at the highest level. Mm -hmm. And so there needs to be a kind of scaffolding for students to become able to do those richest kinds of intellectual inquiries. Mm -hmm. Are there ways that colleges can construct curricula that will um, make that work more successfully. Well, one thing I will say first, before I try to answer your hard question, is that I, I think that I'm constitutionally kind of inclined to a lot of required courses. You know, what I'm talking about here, I, I don't think that if I'd gone and chosen all my own courses, I would have had the educational experience I had at all. And actually, my oldest son was like that too. Some of his friends were going to Hampshire, and he was like, "Mom, I do not want to design my own major." <laughs> you know, um, but I think, you know, I mean, I do think like verbal discourse is important, um, and so maybe thinking about like some freshman class, and I probably in the encounters, you guys think about this. Um, you know, it's like there's there's verbal discourse, there's reading, and there's writing, and all three of these need to be developed. And, um, I, I think, you know, there's very deliberate ways of, of thinking them through. When, when students arrive, um, you know, with writing deficits, I think, you know, there's, you, you guys just have a writing center started and um, But I actually think first about verbally. I think that first about, like, what does it mean, like, kind of, you know, Socratic seminars, and what does it mean to speak from evidence? and to track an argument and um, <clears throat> to sort of really dissect point of view based on the language being used. Um, that is not something that comes easily to anybody of any age. And 
I, I think that that could be done, um, you know, that would go, go a long way, I think. And especially for kids who need that in both reading and writing, it comes first with speaking, right? It's when we speak that we learn the, the first before we can write it. Perhaps um, similar to what you just said, um, what about that kind of literacy for STEM, mm -hmm. science, technology, mathematics, where um, a huge gap is present along lines of gender, socioeconomic mm -hmm. status, and race? Mm -hmm. um, you know, can we do the same thing there in trying to bring up a verbal and a writing literacy? Well, I mean, I would say first that, like, you know, Bob Moses and the Algebra Project, when they said that algebra is a civil rights issue, I so strongly agree with that, and I see that in New York all the time. If kids don't have algebra as ninth graders, they can't have pre-calc. And, you know, I mean, I was just, I just saw something on Twitter about how at Barnard and Columbia, you know, my alma mater, the, the HEOP program, like the Economic Opportunity Program for kids who are less than ideally prepared, they cannot take kids who haven't had pre-calc in high school, right? There's just certain levels they have. And so I think actually that math, I mean here I'm speaking more about math than all of STEM, but I think that math is an incredibly important civil rights issue. And I think the bottom line is it goes to the lack of math ability of most school teachers. You know, that, I mean I'm, I'm coaching teachers right now and they're all about memorizing algorithms and very, very, very little about understanding the conceptual ideas. And so, you know, you just get to a place where that algorithms don't take you anywhere if you don't understand any of the conceptual ideas. Um, and so, I, I mean, I think it's actually really important that that we think about developing the verbal. And, and the common core standards actually really get to that, I would say. It's just they're very challenging to implement given that most of the math teachers are not, their own math ability, you know, they're, they're kind of like me. Like, I mean, I did well in school because I could memorize, but at a certain point, that breaks down in higher level math. When all you know is, well, the teacher told me to do this step for this kind of problem, and I remember it. That's not enough. And so, um, the kind of problem solving and discussion and multiple, asking kids to have multiple ways to solve a problem and why is that the right one and having them debate it. Um, I work with a math coach whose her whole thing is a class should be a math congress and your class should not proceed into additional curriculum until everyone in the room agrees on why that is true. And they agree on it because some of the students have been able to articulate it and they've challenged each other and they've asked each other, but why is that? How do you know? Can you show me? Um, and you know, she faces an uphill battle <laughs> in trying to get teachers to, to do that. But I, I do think that the um, lack of verbal argument in, um, in math, anyway, is a big problem. But I think, I think it's harder in math, at least. Science, perhaps not so much, but I think it's harder in math to take kids in a college who are really have a shortage of background experience. I think humanities, you can move people. Um, and that's why I say I, I actually think that math is a huge civil rights issue right now.
that I was a geographic diversity person, right? I mean, I also know I have good SAT scores, so I didn't like, I don't spend a lot of time thinking, oh, maybe uh, they accepted me only because they had no people with goats in their yard, you know? But um, I think that when you change the conversation to be about talent, but the, the other side of that is maybe you're looking at your legacy admits in a different way, right? And, um, but as part of what they did with making the whole thing be about talent, and uh, they partnered with Posse, and they did a lot, they're doing a lot of outreach in local schools. Like this week right now is um, National College Application Week, and so I just saw on Twitter that Franklin Marshall students have been in the local high schools helping students fill out college applications. So thank you, Vincent. Um, but I, I think they, they shifted their financial aid so that all of it is need based because um, they decided that if they were really going to look at admissions as all being completely about talent, then they did not need merit scholarships. That they were just looking to be able to meet the financial needs of, of everyone they could find who, who they considered to be talented. So, I mean, there's other details, but I do think that they're a school that's really made a shift, a profound shift, um, under the leadership of a president they've had for about five years. And I just think that their thinking is very interesting about it. Um, and he said that it, it really changed the conversation and the sort of the way this, the faculty thought about it, too, when they shifted to trying to get the highest talent kids um, instead of trying to make it be more diverse. Because he believed strongly and he, was re he really, he said that he gives presentations to the faculty all the time on the changing demographics of America. Um, that finding talent in America is fundamentally a changing, di more diverse because we're, be we're becoming a more diverse nation.
kind of impulsive, traumatized experience. Um, you know, I mean, they're, they're, poverty is one thing, but when kids have, you know, parents in jail and uh, unstable housing, and when all of your kids have those things in one room, that's um, different. So I, I wish I could say what I think the answer is. I mean, I do think that um, more real mathematicians becoming math teachers would be a huge improvement. And I think colleges could have some, have some impact on that. <laughs> um, and we have a women who are like to thank you for coming and teaching this subject a lot because it's something that's very important to women and it's something that we're going to do until we can come up with our own solutions for our campus. Uh, and I want to thank everyone who came. Um, this is something that has been going on with women. We've been talking about it, so we would like to thank you guys for coming and listening to what Vicki had to say.